away. Okay, sure. Hi, Derek, and hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to the web webinar today. So, uh, as Derek said, um, I'll do the uh, I'll do the the opening for this and present the first half of today's uh, uh, today's presentation. It looks like we've still got a few people joining, um, but um, I'd just like to begin by saying it's a pleasure to see you all here today. Uh, this is, as you probably understood from the announcement, the second part of our presentation uh, on our global review of uh, the literature on dried fish. Uh, so back in July, we presented the qualitative or quantitative results of our review, where we described the trends in the literature by theme, uh, by geographic focus, by product and by value chain segment. So today, uh, our goal is to present the qualitative assessment of this literature. Uh, as we noticed last time, we analyzed over 1300 different references, which are gathered in our uh, Zotero library, which of course is shared and available to uh, all members of our project and the general public. Uh, and we collaboratively, collaboratively tagged the references in that library using a series of thematic keywords. So on this slide here, uh, you can see the number of references that are directly concerning dried fish, as opposed to those more uh, are we all good? <laughs> As opposed to those directly uh, concerning dried fish uh, incidental to the topic that are listed for each of our main themes. Uh, note that we've deliberately excluded the technical category from this graph since it really dwarfs all the other categories. Uh, there are over a thousand publications uh, on the technical literature alone, and Derek will comment on that later. So our goals in today's uh, webinar presentation are first to summarize the dominant perspectives and approaches uh, in the research according to each of these themes. Uh, second, we'll provide some selected examples of significant, unique, or otherwise helpful research contributions. And third, we'll identify knowledge gaps and how they might be addressed through uh, transdisciplinary research. So uh, this here is the outline of our presentation. I'll present the first four of these themes, ecology, history and change, culture and social relations, and then nutrition, food security and health. Uh, after that, I'll hand things over to Derek who will present the technical literature uh, and Ben will wrap up with a discussion of value chains and governance. And then uh, Derek will provide an overall conclusion. So to start off with our first theme then, uh, ecology, as I'm sure you all know, there is a substantial literature on fisheries ecology, uh, but there are very relatively few studies we found that have directly addressed the relationship of dried uh, and fermented fish processing to ecological factors. So we used the theme ecology tag in our Zotero database. Uh, you'll see this if you look in the uh, database there uh, to identify analyses of the place of dried fish within ecosystems and the environment. Uh, and we identified four main sub themes within this somewhat limited literature. Uh, the first of those is adaptive strategies. Uh, so dried and fermented fish production can be understood as part of cultural adaptive strategies in response to specific environments. So a strong example of this approach would be the work of Kenneth Ruddle. Uh, so for example, Ruddle describes the complementary development of uh, fermented fish and rice in Southeast Asia as a feature of highly seasonal floodplain river environments, uh, which are suited to the alternating production of fish and rice. Okay, uh, so the figure here uh, uh, illustrates a similar ecological argument, uh, in this case for Vietnam. Uh, again, this is from Ruddle's work. He's, he's arguing that uh, Vietnamese fermentation of uh, small fish reflects the seasonal cycle of fish moving close to shore during the monsoons, where they're able to feed on plankton blooms created by upswellings, and they can thus be harvested safely in bulk and fermented uniformly. So the Vietnamese fermentation pro practices in this sense reflect a combination of distinct uh, ecological features and biological rhythms. Uh, our second sub theme within ecology, dried and fermented fish production occurs within uh, human ecological interactions that are implicated in environmental change. Uh, so for instance, changing stocks and catch rates due to overfishing in Lake Albert in Uganda uh, have led to practices of on-boat sun drying of fish. Uh, so the study quoted on this slide notes that in an effort to catch as much of the little remaining fish as possible, a new fishing method that enables fishers to stay on water for prolonged periods of two to three weeks without landing has been introduced. Uh, over this period, gill nets are left in the water and fishes caught are periodically removed without lifting the nets out. The catch is processed, uh, i.e. salted and sun dried on the lake and collected by land-based uh, business owners. 
But we also see significant livelihood impacts of these environmental changes. So for example, an environmental baseline assessment uh, published on the WCS uh, Uganda website indicates that people around Lake Albert used to eat fish five to seven times a week uh, and they sold surplus to buy meat or beans, but now they only eat fish twice or three times a week. Uh, their food expenditures have increased five times. Uh, people who used to be able to sell 300 kilograms of Nile perch per year now only sell about 20 kilograms. Uh, and overall incomes have declined by about 96%, again, uh, resulting from overfishing and environmental change. Uh, third, uh, we uh, note that it's possible to contrast the environmental impacts of different processing methods. So this is one interesting study that we found on Peruvian anchovy chains, anchovy value chains, I should say, as shown here, uh, which assess the energy costs and other impacts of fresh, frozen, canned, and cured anchovies across the different value chains. So this particular study indicates that cured fish uh, involves substantially higher energy costs and processing losses than fresh or frozen uh, fish. Again, looking kind of at the domestic uh, economy in Peru, even when taking into account the energy costs of refrigerated transportation and storage. And finally, political ecology. We can uh, view dried and fermented fish production uh, and interpret it from a political ecology perspective as embedded within socioeconomic relations that involve unequal power over fisheries resources and laborers. So the diagram here is from Max Sitherith, whose uh, work in Cambodian fisheries addresses the systems of exchange among farming and fishing communities. And one of the points in that uh, study there uh, is that declining resources have resulted in competition among fishers, but also generating new political alliances between traders, fishers, and other actors. All right, so moving on to history and change, uh, we use the thematic tag in our Zotero library, history and change, to identify resources that addressed the history or the evolution of the dried fish economy. So we also put historical documents in this category, including publications from uh, relatively recent history, such as scientific reports from the 1970s or earlier, uh, since these are often speaking to changes within uh, the dried fish economy. Um, so uh, the emergence of dried and fermented fish itself generally predates historical records. So archeological research is particularly useful in helping to uh, understand the origins of fish processing. Uh, so for example, in a series of articles uh, sort of ref uh, represented by this illustration here, Van Neer and colleagues have reported on fish bone assemblages uh, indicating the presence of sun-dried, salted and pickled fish at Roman sites, the like ancient Roman sites located in Egypt. So this particular illustration shows a Byzantine temple excavation in Egypt containing a brick floor on which a fish bone concentration was found. Uh, here we have from uh, the salt, uh, an image of salt processing basins from northeastern Thailand. Uh, they, these are contemporary in origin, but they have a technological and geographic continuity with Iron Age salt processing. So Jankowski and colleagues from whose article this image is taken uh, suggest that archaeological research can help understand when and how dried or fermented fish became part of Thailand's cultural foodways by indicating when salt and fish resources came to be stored and subsequently used in large quantities. Uh, pure historical research on dried fish is rare. Uh, this table here is from one of the rare exceptions. It's a chapter by Peter Reeves, Bob Pockrant, and John McGuire, uh, which highlights a notable example of a colonial history approach to dried fish. And I think Ben will talk about this again later in the presentation. Uh, so here, this, uh, this resource describes how official fish curing yards came to be established in parts of India in the 1870s as a mechanism to provide managed exemptions to fish processors from the colonial salt tax, which would have made salt fish processing uh, cost prohibitive. So it appears that these uh, curing yards, which survived well into the 20th century, we've got 1914 as the end date in this table here, uh, they did not entirely benefit the fishers themselves since they supported the emergence of uh, a consolidated class of fish curer slash traders who subsequently entered into bonded arrangements with their suppliers. So uh, a bit of a connection there with our, our upcoming labor theme. 
but this theme of state mediated shifts in economic power, uh, typically away from fishers, primary producers, and towards uh, intermediaries is mirrored in other more uh, recent historical accounts. Uh, so for example, in Canada, the Canadian Saltfish Corporation was established in 1970 uh, to break the fish plant monopoly in Newfoundland, but it ultimately, according to Antler and Ferris, uh, reduced the power of fishers. Uh, I previously mentioned uh, Sitharith's work in Cambodia, uh, which mentions uh, community fisheries uh, as having disrupted traditional systems of barter among the farming and fishing communities, uh, giving rise to a monetized economy in which middlemen were able to set the terms of exchange. Uh, we have some research on contemporary fish processing that has highlighted the role of natural disasters and environmental change in shaping value chains. Uh, so in Sri Lanka, the 2004 Indian Ocean tsunami severely disrupted the fishing economy, leading to a decline in both domestic production and in imports of fish, but simultaneously to an increase in demand for canned and dried fish. And interestingly, we've heard reports from our DFM colleagues in uh, Sri Lanka that you know, we've had similar impacts uh, being felt from the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, the two photographs here are from Lake Liambezi in uh, Namibia. So this lake was completely dry for 22 years, but after the onset of precipitation in the years 2008 to 2010, uh, the 300 square kilometer lake basin filled up again. Uh, and we saw the emergence of a new inland fishery that supplies distant consumers, you know, uh, including you know, line, mine laborers as far as away as the Democratic Republic of Congo. Uh, so they were, these people are being supplied with large volumes of dried fish that was you know, transported away by truckload. Uh, there are some economic studies that have identif identified the impact of market externalities, uh, including both macroeconomic and governance changes on local fish processing in recent history. Uh, so we have some work by Knut Lindqvist and colleagues exploring recent changes in European value chains. Uh, the value chain diagram shown here on this slide <laughs> affects trade in Norwegian salt fish, uh, which is exported to Spain further processed and then either sold locally uh, or re-exported to the uh, Portuguese market. The Lindqvist's uh, work describes the combined impacts of various change changes. Uh, a couple of notable ones would be the increased participation of women in the workforce. Uh, so this has contributed, according to their argument, to demand for semi-processed foods that reduce the time involved in meal preparation. Okay? And a second would be new industrial technologies, notably brine injection. Okay, and finally, within this uh, section here, we have intersection, intersecting with the theme of culture and identity, uh, various case studies that illustrate how dried and fermented fish products uh, are situated within cultural movements that are produced by or that potentially oppose global flows. So the Portuguese national disc bacalao or salt cod shown here at right would be unthinkable without the colonial connections to Newfoundland, which allowed cod, among other uh, ingredients linked to colonial conquest to enter, enter the Portuguese diet in the 16th century. Uh, this map here at the left illustrates the English cod trade in 1697. Uh, almost all of the cod from what is now Atlantic Canada uh, went to Spain, Portugal, and Italy. We have historical uh, studies on Newfoundland and Labrador fishing communities, meanwhile, that provide a clear indication of how these global, you know, these very same global trade relations ultimately shaped both the establishment of isolated coastal communities uh, in Newfoundland and the emergence of a unique culture within them. Uh, as Svanberg tells us, uh, in, uh, fermented fish has recently become an important marker of localness and tradition in the Faroe Islands. Uh, this is a bit paradoxical, though, because it draws on association with global discourses of localness, right, including the slow, uh, the slow movement or slow food movement. So moving on now to the sociocultural uh, dimensions of dried fish, these encompass shared knowledge and practices associated with uh, one or more communities pertaining to the production and use of dried fish products. Uh, our theme Culture and social relations encompasses food and cooking, culture, social relations, well being, uh, and gender. Uh, so, if you look in our Zotero library, you'll see the thematic tag food and cooking, which classifies literature that describes cooking and eating practices, food categorizations, commensality, that is, the social practices of eating together. We didn't actually find all of these things. 
uh, our broader thematic tag culture, social relations, and well-being includes a number of things, subjective well-being, practices to sustain and promote dried fish for cultural objectives, uh, information on the quality of social relations, and cultural understandings of health in relation to food consumption. So we identified several major theoretical approaches within that, uh, looking at the, the study of dried fish preparation and consumption as socio-cultural practice. Um, so the cultural ecology, uh, approach views traditional cultural practices as building on adaptations to an, uh, an ecological environment. So again, the work by Ruddle on fish preservation in Southeast Asia, which I mentioned earlier, fits within this approach. Uh, similarly, we see some research indicating that fish drying should be taken as an adaptive requirement in environments that provide uneven access to fresh fish, either due to seasonal availability of uh, fish or to the need to exploit fish in combination with inland resources. So this pyramid diagram that I put on the slide um, uh, shows these ecological conditions as the cultural base uh, with the adaptations in the middle. And uh, you know, from this model, the cultural preferences for dried fish uh, can, uh, you know, at the very top there, can be traced back to specific oh. environmental conditions in which uh, fish preservation originally offered a means of avoiding food shortage. Uh, second, the indigenous knowledge and practices associated with traditional dried fish may be documented using uh, ethnographic or ethnoscientific methods. Uh, there are quite a number of articles documenting traditional methods of preparing fermented fish products in journals such as the Indian Journal of Traditional Knowledge and the Korea-based Journal of Ethnic Foods. Uh, so here we have the table of contents for an issue of the uh, Indian Journal of Traditional Knowledge and the bottom article here uh, listed in this issue is entitled Masular, a traditional fish product of the Thero community of Nepal. Uh, this particular article reports on how Masular, a dry flat cake is made from dried fish and bottle gourd leaves. Uh, how it's made, how it's prepared, and how it's consumed, but it also provides a, a nutritional, microbiological, and cost uh, analysis of the product. So this is fairly typical of uh, a, a large set of uh, literature uh, out of what we looked at. Uh, third, the role of dried fish in modern contexts can be explored as cultural heritage by investigating how communities embrace connections of dried fish with history, place, and custom. So research taking this particular approach have tended to focus on, the Euro on European fish, such as bacalhau or the Portuguese salt cod, which is embedded in collective identity uh, narratives, can be seen, according to some authors, as a form of cultural capital. Uh, similarly, we have research by Nuigard, who has recently argued Argued that the consumption of surströming, the fermented, uh, the Swedish fermented uh, herring, um, helps construct a traditional rural identity. Right, so eating this fermented fish positions you as a rural uh, consumer, uh, you know, having this rural culture in opposition to modern urban values. Uh, a related approach to this one takes dried fish as part of foodways, which are systems of culturally significant practices through which uh, identity is negotiated through local foods, such as fermented fish in Thailand or smoked uh, tuna in Indonesia. Uh, on this slide, we have a definition of foodways from Hayward and Moss as a research field that perceives the system of production, circulation, and consumption of foodstuffs as A, culturally significant for the individuals and communities involved in various aspects of the system, B, mutable and dynamic, and C, enmeshed within intersecting realms, i.e. economics, politics, culture, religion, etc. So Hayward and Moss take a foodways uh, approach to studying smoked fish in Ambon City in Indonesia. Uh, so fishing villages came to be absorbed by the growing city in the 1980s and 1990s. Uh, then in 1990, Muslim Christian riots in the city center led to the temporary displacement of fish markets towards the periphery. Uh, subsequently, when things calmed down and the markets, uh, the fresh fish markets were able to move back into the city center, uh, the people who remained at the periphery uh, from those absorbed villages, uh, you know, took on smoked tuna uh, production and sales. So this became a dedicated smoked tuna tuna market area. Uh, this smoked tuna market precinct was located incidentally on the road towards the airport. So according to the authors, smoked tuna 
came to be packaged as carry-on items for Indonesian travelers on their way to the airport, and, in the, and subsequently came to represent a distinct culinary specialty of Ambon City. So in this sense, uh, Hayward and Moss are arguing that smoked tuna, tuna is a dynamic and changing food heritage that is enabled by, quote, modernity, urbanity, political instability, and touristification. Okay, so uh, not a stable uh, cultural practice, but something that is dynamic and mutable, uh, according to this food waste perspective. Uh, fourth, uh, dried fish can be approached as a subject within global food history, recognizing the role of dried fish as culturally important commodities within global, global trade systems. Uh, a particularly important, uh, significant historical dried fish product uh, is the fermented fish sauce garum, a central element of ancient Greco-Roman cuisine. Uh, this was celebrated for its flavor and supposed medicinal value in addition to serving as a major trade commodity. So here on this slide, we have remains of an ancient Roman garum factory, which is located in what's today Portugal. Uh, in some settings, garum finds itself at the intersection of food history and gastronomy. So taking an experiential approach to food history, a medieval Roman banquet was reconstructed at the Ashmolean Museum in 2017, for example, which uh, featured a menu consisting largely of salt fish and garum flavored dishes. Um, as a second example, uh, a team of Danish food scientists have recently developed a series of modern experimental garum. All right, so gastronomy. Uh, and fifth, taste for fish may be considered as a cultural at attribute. So this idea of culturally informed acceptability, this idea of acceptability uh, figures prominently in the research on product development and consumer preference. So much of the technical literature that Derek will describe. Uh, so we have studies describing, for instance, local of quality appreciation uh, criteria for Lanhuan, which is a fish-based condiment in Benin. We have uh, fermentation leading to improved acceptability of poor tasting fish in Nigeria, regionally distinct tastes for salted cod in different parts of Spain. We have, as shown on the slide here, the contrast and acceptability criteria for cured sprats between Estonia and Thailand. So here on the slide, we've got EST for Estonia, for instance, the cluster EST1 uh, includes uh, flavor characteristics such as, uh, or sensory characteristics such as meat color and general spiciness, corresponding to the strong Estonian preference for spice cured uh, Sprat products. And finally, uh, our analysis of food and cooking revealed several gaps. Uh, so we recognize the importance of food, uh, dried fish in many communities to well-being and commensality. I mentioned we were looking for those themes, but we found very little direct attention to these cultural aspects in the literature under review. Uh, an additional area of importance for future research that we note, uh, dried fish has been identified as a culturally appropriate food among migrants and refugees or among uh, indigenous groups uh, representing a dim dimension of cultural food security. Uh, and we've seen some uh, reference to that uh, in the Canadian context as well. So this idea of cultural food security has been proposed by Elaine Power uh, to challenge this market supply demand focus of standard definitions of food security. Um, so culturally appropriate food politicizes this process by expressing resistance against various uh, structural factors, including displacement from traditional territories, species extinction, decreased opportunities for transfer of cultural knowledge, uh, increased uptake of market food, uh, and so on. Uh, now, gender, I've addressed the topic of gender separate from uh, or separately within cultural, culture and social relations. It's a very significant topic on its own. Uh, we applied the thematic tag of gender to resources that described women's role in the social economy of dried fish, uh, relations between men and women in social economies or uh, potentially masculinities. So as Ben Belton and, and other colleagues within this project have pointed out in the previous publications, much of the literature on fisheries focuses on fishers rather than onshore processors. So women's labor as a result tends to be uh, relatively invisible. But worldwide, as we know, the preparation of dried, smoked, and fermented fish is almost universally conducted by women. Uh, the economic value and status of whose labor is often quite low. So the graphic here, uh, uh, shows the highly gendered nature of the fish uh, value chain in Karnataka with marketing and processing of fish being predominantly female. 
Uh, this is just an illustrative example. Uh, globally, we find that women rarely participate in offshore catch directly, although they'll mend nets or may harvest low value inland species or shellfish. In some instances, they can be financial managers uh, and boat owners. Women are almost always involved in fish processing, although in some places men may participate also. Uh, in some countries, women may run wholesale or retail businesses, uh, sometimes independently of a processing operation. Um, several studies of women's labor in fisheries identify technical or material barriers to economic inclusion uh, or productivity. Uh, and so they'll talk about factors such as poor access to capital, cost of storage, price fluctuations, packaging challenges. And these studies tend to prioritize targeted interventions, especially microcredit as avenues to economic inclusion. Uh, conversely, we see uh, in this example here, Rabini and colleagues have modeled this application of a more holistic, sustainable livelihood approach, uh, demonstrating that dried fish processors in Bangladesh draw regularly on valuable asset portfolios that ex extend beyond fish. Uh, so these include poultry, weaving, handicrafts, and all of these provide significant income in the lean season. Uh, the broader social, social and economic structures can also uh, shape women's participation in fish processing and marketing. Uh, looking at the Lake Victoria fishery, Madara and colleagues observed that women processors' status has declined as a result of market consolidations and restructurings, which led to the exclusion of women who previously held positions of power uh, in small-scale production and trade networks. Cole and colleagues, as shown in the slide here, uh, applying a social ecological systems approach to the Bharatse floodplain fishery in Zambia, argue that gender inequality uh, contributes to a maladaptive path dependency that they're describing as a social ecological trap. So that's represented in this diagram here. The yellow box in this vicious cycle or trap uh, highlights gender inequalities as contributing to suboptimal processing, storage, and handling technologies. That is to say, inefficient drying and smoking methods. So these uh, arguably create low outputs and low income that lead to increased fishing um, and in turn reduce uh, fish stock. And we have the cycle of uh, ongoing decline in, in productivity. So while several studies that we examined in this re review claim to apply a gender lens, very few recognize the critical perspectives on gender taken in social science and feminist theory. One notable contribution to gender ideologies in fish value chains is Aswathi and Kalpana's study of gender in a Muslim fishing village in Kerala, uh, which describes how women engaged in fish drying and vending tactically negotiate the competing ideological expectations of feminine domesticity on the one hand and women's entrepreneurship on the other as, as supported by the state uh, set against this context of rapid socioeconomic change. We have the industrialization of the fishery and increasing male migration since the late 1980s. <clears throat> we see these ideologies at work in the statement by women quoted in the article. So uh, quoting, uh, commenting on the role of the state in promoting uh, female entrepreneurship. We have the first uh, person quoted here saying that it's, it's through the SHD or self-help group classes that we got the courage to do business. We began to think of the importance of our own money and ways of, mon uh, of making money. Uh, but also in the second quote here, it's after the self-help groups that uh, younger women entered vending. Otherwise, Muslim women do not sell fish. And on the persistence of gender ideologies, the third quote, I go to Anjuthingu and take part in the auction and buy fish. But in the Vitur seashore, I make, uh, I make someone purchase fish for me and I stand in a shed. I don't want to be seen in the seashore with fish. It will shame the male and elders in my I imprisonly, imprisonly. Huh? <laughs> All right. So our next theme includes research on uh, nutrition, food, security, and health. And this uh, overlaps uh, significant with the technological technical literature that Derek will describe and will sort of lead into that. So we applied this thematic tag of nutrition and food security to resources that analyzed nutritional properties of dried fish or the population uh, nutritional contribution of dried fish consumption. And we use the thematic tag of health to studies that link dried fish to health, for example, uh, analyses of the health impacts of high sodium consumption from salted fish. So, uh, so a range of development initiatives have made the case that dried fish is essential to reducing malnutrition among the world's poor. 
Uh, we have consumption surveys that indicate that traditionally dried fish already provides a significant proportion of animal protein intake in the global south, particularly among urban communities. Uh, and consumers. Uh, small fish, which are typically processed and consumed whole, uh, additionally provide a majority of calcium intake among the world's poorest. Uh, the FAO has promoted sun-dried fish production to tackle food security in Somalia. Uh, nutrition scientists funded by Nida, Danida have engineered nutrition-dense food supplements that include dried fish uh, designed for the extremely poor in Cambodia and Kenya. This table here on the slide uh, is from an article describing the composition of four experimental nutrition-dense food supplements in Cambodia. The first of these, WF, I believe it's a world fish uh, supplement, includes white, white rice, two species of dried fish, spiders, vegetable oil, and sugar. Uh, so there is a significant applied and gray literature that exists in the areas of health, nutrition, and food security. Household surveys and market in inventories by FAO, by World Fish, and by other international organizations provide a sense of consumption patterns in individual countries or communities, but this information is not necessarily comparable across sites, and fish consumption data uh, tends to be disaggregated by species, but not by fish products. So we don't see this disaggregation by fresh versus frozen, dried, or fermented fish. Uh, the topic of food security is not directly addressed in much of the literature we, re we reviewed, although a number of development sector reports uh, or technical reports often address improvements to dried fish production as a means to, uh, means to greater food security with a focus on post-harvest loss reduction. So linking to our earlier theme of cultural ecology, uh, the importance of dried fish to food security in arid regions is evident from historical and archaeological research. Uh, in the Sudan, for instance, Dirar has argued that dried fish emerged along with other dried and fermented foods as famine or survival foods designed to help overcome food shortages. Uh, similarly, El Mahi uh, suggests there is significant, uh, there is evidence that dried fish had a particularly important food security role in the arid Middle East as a primary food during periods of extreme food scarcity among inland communities, right? So not fishing communities, but inland communities uh, where dried fish also served as livestock feed and as fertilizer for date trees. Uh, a substantial proportion of nutritional research concerning dried and fermented fish involves either nutrient or microbiological analysis of existing products. So nutrient content analysis has been useful in demonstrating the nutritional value of dried and fermented fish products, typically by profiling the micronutrients, protein, fatty acids, fiber, ash, and moisture content of products that are available in local markets. Uh, so, and we have some studies that have tested the effects on these nutritional profiles of uh, variables such as temperature and other environmental storage conditions, methods of fish handling and evisceration, the degree of fermentation, uh, salt concentration, or smoking and drying techniques. So as a whole, this research suggests the possibility of enhancing nutritional quality through processing improvements. Uh, there are several research groups that have also isolated and characterized lactic acid bacteria strains in fermented fish products, supporting the goal of improving uh, production technologies or developing mixed starter cultures for the industrial processing of products with optimal sensorial, probiotic, and microbial uh, safety characteristics. And food quality analyses have identified various forms of contamination affecting traditional, uh, uh, pr traditionally produced dried fish. So in addition to physical contaminants such as sand, where we have fish dried on the beach, for instance, uh, dried fish have been found to be contaminated with heavy metals such as lead or mercury or even microplastics consumed by the live fish. Uh, a more significant and widespread source of contamination involves hazardous pesticides applied directly to fish by processors and traders to prevent losses due to blowfly and beetle infestation. Uh, although widespread application of controlled or banned toxins such as DDT and dichlorovos has been a recognized problem since the 1980s, safe alternatives have yet to be adopted on a wide scale. Uh, and hazardous pesticide levels continue to be detected in dried and smoked uh, fish samples from Nigeria, India, and Bangladesh. 
A substantial number of microbiological studies of dried and fermented fish products have identified unsafe bacteria or fungi in commercially available products from local markets, uh, occasionally measured in relation to variables such as storage temperature, the use of improved technologies such as uh, solar dryers, the ingredients and processing conditions, or the starter cultures used in fermentation. Uh, the survival of zoonotic parasites in fermented fish products is also a potential concern, but it's not one that's received much research attention. And finally, in the case of smoked fish, uh, several studies have measured known genotoxins, notably uh, carcinogenic polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, PAH, that commonly occur in smoked foods. Recent analyses of product samples from Sub-Saharan Africa, Eastern Europe, and Asia have found PAH levels far in excess of limits set in food safety regulations. So although the pace of research on the dietary impacts of dried fish consumption has slowed, uh, research from previous decades uh, did link regular consumption of salted or smoked fish to various disease risks. In particular, multiple dietary studies from the 1980s and 1990s identified salted fish consumption as a risk factor contributing to the relatively high incidence of uh, nasopharyngeal carcinoma among Cantonese, Malaysian, and other uh, Southeast Asians, although this correlation has more recently been challenged. Uh, other research has suggested a connection between salted fish intake and hypertension or brain cancer ri risk. Uh, fermented fish sauce has been linked to esophageal cancer. Uh, and among smoked fish processors, long-term and continuous exposure to smoke can additionally be a source of respiratory disease. So overall, uh, research on food safety and nutritional aspects of dried and fermented fish addresses several long-term, uh, long-standing challenges. As early as the 1970s, field experiments were being conducted with the use of improved fish drying methods, such as elevated racks, as seen as in this image from an FAO handbook published in 1976, or the application of less hazardous pesticides to control blowfly and beetle infestations during, during the sun drying of fish. Uh, the poor adoption of safe and effective processing technologies suggests a need for greater attention to the social socioeconomic factors that may limit their uptake. All right, well, that's it for my section. Now I'll hand things over to Derek, who will talk about the technical literature. Thank Derek. you very much, Eric, for that very comprehensive overview of the, the themes to this point. So uh, Eric, could you switch? There we go, great. So as Eric mentioned earlier on at the beginning of the presentation, there is a great imbalance in the literature on dried fish. And so the previous image showing the, the, the thematic representation across the literature that you presented did not include the technical theme. And so now that we've added the technical theme, you can see how dramatically it dominates the global literature on dried fish. In this part of the presentation, there is a bit of a paradox. And that is, even though the technical literature is, is highly dominant in the literature within the context of this presentation, we're actually going to not devote as much time or space to it as Eric has just devoted to, to many of these other sub-themes. Uh, one of the reasons for that, that paradox is that within the DFM project, it's in fact the other sub-themes that are central to the research we're doing. So we wanna make sure that in, in our coverage of the literature that we, that we attentively uh, cover in a more nuanced and detailed way, these other sub-themes besides the technical. A second explanation for that paradox is that, uh, and this is a very practical one, uh, we, have, we have gone through quite carefully all of the other sub-themes uh, in, a, in a more advanced way, let's say, than we have with the technical sub-theme. The technical sub-theme is the last theme on which we are still in the process of analyzing closely. So at the moment, we've done 40% of the technical references. Uh, so we haven't covered the full the, the full basket of those technical references. Uh, but I think from that 40%, we already have a very clear sense of the, sh the shape of the technical literature. Uh, and then finally, uh, another reason for this paradox is that in fact, some of the key, key ideas, key findings that come out of this technical literature, Eric has already covered in some depth in his discussions of health and nutrition. Okay, so Eric, next slide, please. So the technical theme then definitionally from, from our literature review perspective is, is works that are grounded in scientific or engineering analysis and methods. So it, it's works that, 
have at their heart a very deliberate application of a scientific approach to knowledge generation. And then as, as we've gone through these references within the technical literature, it, it really dawned on me that we can broadly categorize them as falling within the food science envelope or the food science disciplinary perspective. The, the very vast majority of them are about dried fish as a product type and investigations of dried fish as a product type and, and particularly efforts to try to improve dried fish products. Next slide, slide please. So what I've tried to do in this slide is to provide the main themes that characterize, the, the sub-themes that characterize this technical literature. And you can, you can make a kind of story out of these sub-themes. So at the center of it is this food science uh, approach to dried fish products, and that's, a, that's in the oval. But coming out of that is a number of spokes, and each of these spokes speak to different sub-themes. And so the story, I think, really starts with the bottom right sub-theme, and that is the motivations that underpin this technical literature on dried fish. And I think that literature from, again, from a food science perspective is motivated either explicitly or implicitly by an interest in improving health outcomes uh, through dried fish products. So improvements in dried fish products in order to enhance health outcomes or alternately through the improvement of dried fish products in order to stimulate economic benefits. Okay, so I think that's, Thinks that that's what motivates much of the research in this. And then the other spokes in this diagram unfold from that foundational um, motivation, set of motivations. Okay, so, and the, the two major areas of work I would identify in the top left and top right spokes, those are processing technologies and methods and packaging technologies and methods. And of those two, the processing technologies and methods is by far the larger area of work. But both of those areas of the application of scientific methods to product uh, analysis and product improvement are aimed at achieving either enhanced health outcomes or economic outcomes through product improvement, through improved processing techniques, or through better packaging in order to preserve uh, product quality. Then there's a the other spoke at the top there is, is, a, is a relatively minor area of the literature, but a very important one. There are a number of, uh, there are a number of contributions to the literature, which are often in a textbook or handbook kind of format that provide overviews of, or categorization schemes of, of the different kinds of products within the basket of dried fish. And they provide definitions to support those different product types. And so those are very extremely useful references for us within the Dried Fish Matters project in terms of defining the landscape of what we're looking at. Then the bottom left spoke, component analysis, this is one of the, this is one of the key methods that is used to analyze what constitutes the nutritional or contaminant properties of a dried fish product. Uh, and so they, I've separated this out because there, there's work in this area that is either on the analysis of existing dried fish products with the intent of often over time of seeing degradation of those components, um, but also there are a number of works which are intending to develop new methodological approaches for studying the components of dried fish. And, and by doing so, they, they're often positioned to make a broader contribution to the food science literature. So they're not specifically necessarily aimed at dried fish, but they're, they're testing methods, techniques that can contribute to the larger um, array of different methods that are used within food science. And then I have this final spoke, the other catch all. And at the moment that, that particular category is a fairly empty one in our analysis. And I suspect it will largely remain that way, um, but it's, it's to include materials that don't easily fit within these other areas. Okay, and so at the moment, I think we just have one or two references in that. Eric, next slide, please. Okay, so I'm going to give you three examples of this, uh, this sort of food science interest in dried fish, um, dried fish as, a, as a subject for analysis. 
so the first one is related to this top spoke on the diagram I just showed you. This is the, the sort of the, the dried fish manuals, dried fish textbook approach, uh, which categorizes subtypes of dried fish and then gives definitions or explanations of those, uh, those different subtypes of dried fish. So in this case, we have uh, one of about three or four tables from this particular reference, um, which, in, which outlines different subtypes of, of dried fish um, in different parts of the world, and then provides some quite interesting and useful information about the characteristic species and method associated with the production of each of those dried fish subtype products. And so in this case, we have the first table, which is uh, showing comparatively across the globe different methods for producing fish sauce with the names of the, the product itself. Um, and then on the right, another, another interesting component of this particular work is uh, a graphical explanation of how a particular fish sauce product is manufactured in one particular geographical context. And so the, the, uh, this, this chapter in a book um, gives us not a comprehensive treatment of all of the different production processes, but it gives us a sort of rep representative sample of different production processes for producing these uh, different dried fish products. And it sort of hints at um, the possibility of a larger research that would uh, even more comparatively develop a kind of encyclopedia of subtypes of dried fish products and the, the methods used comparatively for producing them. Next slide, please, Eric. So a second example arising from this literature then is focusing on the, uh, the, the spoke of the diagram that's looking at processing techniques, technologies, methods, and in, in this case, particularly looking at, at improvements in, in processing techniques. And so what we have here is an analysis of the properties of the application, or the properties related to the application of different chemical additives in treatments of dry, well, fermented dried fish in this case. And it compares the effectiveness of those different chemical additives for, um, for the reduction in degradation of lipids within, within the fish product. And lipids are very important nutritionally. Um, it's through lipids that uh, consumers get access to important micronutrients. And so if those lipids degrade, access to those micronutrients is lost. And so, so from, a, from a, um, a, a health and nutrition point of view, it's the, this kind of research is, is, is very useful for trying to extend the shelf life of dried fish and maximize its nutritional bioavailability, let's say. Um, and so one of, the, one of the interesting footnotes too, that uh, relates perhaps more to the economic implications of this research is that in the comparison between these different chemical additives, the, the authors indicate that one of them, even though it had pretty good outcomes in terms of uh, lipid preservation, from a consumer point of view was, was disagreeable because it left a, a reddish color residue on the fish product. Um, and so therefore was less marketable. Um, so it, it, you know, that, that footnote suggests then both it suggests the economic implications of this kind of research in addition to the more obvious health and nutrition implications of this kind of research. Eric, next slide. And then a final example is, um, is a fairly unusual case. And this is one that, that Eric has already hinted at, but there is a, there is a sub sub theme with this, within this literature of work on dried fish that seeks to identify new products that can be then marketable. So, uh, so this, this research has a very clear economic inspiration to it, but, but sometimes also, as in, as, as in the case of this example, has a health implication to it. So this is research from the Indian Northeast, uh, and the, the authors hypothesize that in the Indian Northeast, there are likely to be many new bacterial um, strains that will have valuable health 
benefits to them. And, and they're thinking particularly of the probiotic function of bacterial products. They note that there is a broader emerging literature globally about the importance, the, the health importance of probiotics. And they suggest that within the within the, the, the multiple different fermented fish products that exist in the Indian Northeast, there must be uh, what they call potent um, probiotic strains that could then potentially be scaled up and industrialized uh, for broader health benefit, but also for economic returns. And, and in their research, they identify one strain in particular, which they've identified here in this diagram as the most potent isolate. And so this most potent, potent isolate they find actually from, a, um, from an impact point of view and from a, <clears throat> a probiotic quality point of view is actually uh, more effective than many of the potential uh, competitor strains from an economic point of view. So it, it has potential value from a health and economic perspective that, that outweighs uh, many of its other um, many of the other strains that exist in the probiotic market. Uh, so they're identifying, in other words, uh, a real economic opportunity that exists in, in extracting strains of probiotic bacteria from these traditional fermented fish products in the Indian Northeast. Okay, so that's it. I just wanted to give you an illustration then of uh, some of the, the, the quite interesting outcomes from this, this technical research, but not to try to give you the comprehensive overview that Eric did in the preceding sub-themes. So now I'll pass it over to Ben. Okay, thank you, Derek. Thank you, Eric. Uh, this is gonna be slightly uh, ad-libbed. I just arrived from a, another call, but uh, hopefully it will be interesting anyway. Um, so next slide, please. Okay, so the, the value chains in microeconomics, is the second largest theme in terms of numbers of publications after the technical theme that Derek has just talked about. Um, and there are sort of a few elements here. So one is uh, sort of empirical studies of dried fish value chains, looking at them in terms of uh, economic activities, um, sort of mapping flows of resources, capital, labor throughout those segments and looking at how value is added at different segments. Um, understanding economic relations in fish drying and marketing, and uh, to some extent analyzing choices about consumption that consumers and households make and their preferences. Next slide, please. Okay, so in the course of uh, tagging and then going back through all of these references, um, we've kind of grouped them under subheadings that sort of emerged um, from, from that qualitative analysis. So the first subheading here is um, descriptive assessments of value chains and markets. So this is by far the largest subgroup of articles in the value chains and microeconomics theme. Um, and so the, the image on the left here um, is, I guess, what people uh, typically think of when they think value chain study, right? It's a map showing the flows of, of fish through from, from fishers, through, through traders to wholesalers, through processors and so on, and eventually reaching the consumer. Um, and so uh, actually, if you look at the, the evolution of the literature, it's quite interesting. So before the 2000s, um, there were lots of these kind of studies um, but they tend to be uh, framed as market studies or sectoral studies. So they're really kind of um, descriptive analyses of all of the, that go into, into dried fish production. Um, as, and, and so uh, the 2000 onwards, there's a sort of change in the nomenclature. People start to use the term value chains, but actually um, <clears throat> very often, and in this subgroup of literature, there's not really much of a difference between market studies and value chain studies. Um, they're typically qualitative, um, sort of based on key informant interviews and rapid appraisals. Um, and some of them include some financial analysis. So trying to understand um, the marketing margins at different segments of the value chain, for instance. Um, most of these are focused in Africa and Asia, and very often their outputs of 
um, development projects. So typically, um, at some point in a project, a value chain analysis or a market study is conducted to sort of identify um, what's going on and where projects could in intervene. And so that accounts for a lot of these studies. Um, and the quality is very variable. So the, the map here on the left is actually from a very good example of a very rigorous um, value chain study from the northeast of India. Um, <clears throat> but there are many studies which are uh, of lesser quality also. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so the next subset um, under this theme uh, is what you might call business management studies. So unlike the, the sort of descriptive value chain studies, which tend to be focused in the global south, um, the business management type studies um, tend to be focused um, predominantly on the trade in salted cod between northern Europe and southern Europe. So Iceland, Norway, uh, to Spain and Portugal, essentially. Um, and so the best example of this is this book here that you can see on the right, Nordic Iberian Cod Value Chains explaining salted fish trade patterns. This is a publication in the, the Mara publication series. Um, and so these studies are interested in questions of traceability, um, supply chain management, product quality, um, and uh, often in sort of how the industry can be upgraded, how supply chains can be better managed, often for the, for the best, of, uh, you know, the in northern Europe that are producing and exporting these fish. Um, quite often they're sort of they're theoretically grounded studies, un unlike the more descriptive value chain studies or market studies. So some of them draw on economic geography, others draw on concepts from um, business studies, uh, sort of um, uh, agribusiness studies. Um, and it's interesting that there's only one really comparable study that we, we came across from the Global South, and that's in Indonesia. And it's looking at um, sort of the, the, the effects of um, imports of dried fish from ASEAN countries and, and how Indonesia can compete. Okay, next uh, slide, please. Okay, so microeconomic studies um, cover four uh, main areas, so sort of sub 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 themes, if you like. Um, so one is demand. So this is uh, typically sort of based on um, household surveys, and it's looking at, at elasticities of demand for different um, dried fish products. So that that sort of um, if the price of of dried fish increases, um, how much will uh, consumption reduce? Um, for instance, or if people's income increases, how much will uh, consumption increase? And then what's the substitutability between different types of uh, fish and other products? Um, then there's a set of studies on consumer preferences. So this is try typically um, quite often using sort of experimental economic methods, trying to um, elicit um, how much consumers would be willing to pay for a new type of product. Uh, or in some cases, new type, different types of packaging for dried fish. Um, then we have studies of price formation and price trans transmission. So this is studies that look at if uh, markets become more integrated over space through uh, better transport linkages or uh, freer trade, for instance, what effect does that have on dried fish prices? Uh, what what effects do uh, the, does quality have on price? or market structure, if, if the market is very concentrated, how does that impact price? Um, and then the fourth set um, is technology adoption. So the best example here is uh, one study that looks at the profitability of smoking fish using different types of wood that could be an alternative to mangrove wood, and then trying to understand whether um, processors would adopt those, uh, those new uh, types. And the table at the bottom here is from quite a nice Nigeria, um, which uses a sort of microeconomic technique to, to ask the question, are, mi are middlemen really exploitative? So this is a common perception. And so through a value chain study, um, they're able to analyze the, the marketing margins at different steps in the chain and try and answer this question. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, then a really small subset of these studies looks at waste and loss. Um, 
So in the technical literature, there are also studies looking at waste and loss. So for instance, um, how much uh, dried fish is lost due to insect damage. Um, these, these studies are a bit different in that they typically have take a whole um, value chain approach and they're sort of studying the reasons for waste and loss and quantifying that um, all throughout the value chain at the different nodes. Um, so you can see here from a, a very recent paper from Malawi, they've um, really sort of meticulously documented uh, all of the different nodes in the chain, uh, the, the physical losses of fish, the economic losses of fish due to loss of quality or damage. Um, and uh, yeah, so, that, so those are a, a sort of small subset of studies. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, and then I think the, the final subset in this category is studies that look at the social dynamics of markets and livelihoods. Um, again, these tend to focus particularly on the global south. Um, they're drawn mainly from the disciplines of anthropology and geography. Um, and very often they take a political ecology approach um, or they're interested in understanding the socialization of fishing and fish marketing. And they look at things like the uh, drivers such as globalization, ecological change, um, social relations, the effect of migration, the effect of culture, and how the interplay of these kind of um, these processes and, and uh, things on fish, li on, on, on livelihoods. Um, and then there's another sort of subset of these studies, which are more just descriptive studies, um, sort of um, describing how traders and retailers behave. Uh, and so the illustration on the, on the right is from a, a really nice kind of political ecology study uh, from, I think, uh, Zambia. Uh, and it's looking at how changes in weather and changes in uh, copper mining have, have affected the, the evolution of fish marketing um, from Zambia. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so this theme is economy. This is distinct from microeconomy. Microeconomy is um, sort of studying the economic activity of um, individual actors, so uh, fishers, households, so on. Uh, the economy theme is a lot broader than that. Um, uh, so it's sort of macroeconomic analysis, sort of changes in the structure of the economy over time. Uh, and how they affect dried fish production, consumption, trade. Uh, and often these have a historical uh, perspective. So there's a lot of overlap here with um, the, the history theme. Um, and actually this theme we haven't um, gone through in detail and actually written up. So I think we only have one slide on the economy, but lots of overlap with history. Uh, next uh, slide, please. Okay, labour. So as, as, as I think Eric mentioned, um, articles under the labour theme um, really often about, uh, about work as much as about labour. So, um, you know, labour can be seen in terms of social relations, it can be seen um, as a factor of production, but a lot of these studies are really talking about the social organisation of work uh, and to some extent the quality of work or, or working conditions. Um, so next slide, please. Okay, so there's sort of two uh, sub-themes that I've bundled together here in this slide. One is the anthropology of work, and uh, the other one is sort of gendered uh, studies of work. Um, so under the anthropology of work, there's um, uh, several sort of very rich kind of ethnographical studies, uh, and in some cases kind of historical, um, studies of uh, fisheries, particularly in Newfoundland, in Canada. Um, and uh, so that tends to be where those, uh, the anthropology of work is focused. Studies from the global, global south tend to focus more on the gendered nature of work in fisheries. Um, you know, who performs which roles, what's, what's the division of the gender division of labor um, within uh, dried fish uh, value chains. Um, so many of these are very descriptive, they're just about who does what, um, but there are some notable exceptions that apply at sort of more um, theoretically grounded or critical uh, sort of gender studies lens. So a good uh, example here is uh, the, the quote 
which is drawn from an article by Holly Hapke and the co-author Anand Keril uh, and on gender, the work-life course and livelihood strategies in a South Indian fish market. Um, okay, next slide, please. So the, the, the next sort of subset um, here is uh, studies that deal with exploitative, uh, exploitative working conditions. Um, so these are predominantly um, focused on Bangladesh. Um, and so really the, the classic um, study here is this, this uh, book, Slaves for a Season, Bondage uh, Child Labor in the Dried Fish Industry, um, which is a sort of really detailed um, anthropological study of um, bonded labor um, and, uh, and, and slave-like uh, labor in, uh, on the island of Dublachar. Um, there are several other studies um, that have taken place on Dublachar. Um, it's quite a notorious um, place. Um, but even but, uh, there, are, there are much fewer studies from elsewhere in Bangladesh looking at, looking at labor conditions. Um, there's another study from India that looks at sort of arduous working conditions uh, and, and another um, from Myanmar. Um, uh, but really nothing outside of, uh, of these areas uh, apart from those. Okay, next. So um, policy and governance um, is the next uh, theme. Um, and so uh, articles uh, under the policy and governance theme um, sort of tend to address um, the governance of fisheries um, and then the governance of trade, um, the governance of prices, um, the governance of food safety. So through, you know, the effects of regulations, uh, laws and formal and informal mechanisms um, uh, on the, the production uh, and distribution of dried fish. Next slide. Okay, so the first subset that we've identified here is studies that document the history of policy impacts on fisheries development in fisheries that um, have a large uh, sort of proportion of the fish going to uh, dried fish production. Um, and so these cover a whole range of different geographies and a whole range of different time periods. So. Uh, the two really classic examples of studies in this sort of tradition are the closing of the frontier by Butcher, which is the history of marine fisheries in Southeast Asia from 1850 to 2000. Uh, highly recommended book and lots and lots in there on, on dried fish. Uh, and another sort of classic study in this area is COD by Mark Polanski, um, which looks at the history uh, of the, the, the cod trade. And historically, most of that was salted cod um, from uh, Northern Europe and then from the Americas um, and, sort of, and sort of sets the uh, development of those fisheries within these broader um, sort of historical, economic and, and, and policy shifts uh, over time. Um, other examples uh, that, um, is, uh, for instance, is Reeves, which um, Eric has already mentioned on the effects of the colonial salt tax policy, salt tax policy on the organization of India's fish curing yards. Uh, and another good example is uh, a series of studies that look at the interplay between formal state-led fisheries policy and governance and informal governance mechanisms, and those span um, Africa uh, through to uh, North America, Canada. Uh, next, please. Okay, so those were studies that looked at the impacts of policy on fisheries development. Um, these are, uh, there's another subset of studies which looks at the um, effects of fisheries management and trade. Uh, so, so, so it's like the more policy oriented studies. So trying to understand uh, the impacts of uh, policy on fish marketing and trade, including dried fish. Um, so examples uh, include uh, Neelan and Bene looking at um, the Lake Chad Basin. And so th th this subset of studies, what marks them out from the previous set of studies is that they're really policy oriented. They're um, sort of trying to come up with policy recommendations um, that can sort of improve 
uh, the, 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 the management of fisheries and, and, uh, and people's livelihoods. Um, and another couple of noteworthy studies are from Kent uh, from the late 1980s. And he provided a really comprehensive early review of the role of fish and lots of attention to dried fish products, but the, the role of fish in uh, alleviating malnutrition in the global south. And that again is a very sort of policy uh, oriented set of, set of works. Next, please. Okay, and then again, uh, we have another subset of studies that deals with this sort of modern trade in salted cod from North, Northern Europe to the Iberian Peninsula. And so this is really illustrated, nicely illustrated here by this map that's taken from uh, a paper called Governance, Quality Conventions and Product Innovation in the Valley Chain, the case of the Spanish salted fish market. And so what the map is showing is the consumer preferences for different um, types of uh, salted fish products um, in Spain. Um, so these studies are sort of rooted in ideas uh, or con conceptualizations of va value chains that really emphasize value. How is the value chain organized? How do different actors in the chain coordinate? Um, and they tend to be sort of applied studies as well. So they're focused on innovation, competitiveness, uh, and public policy to, to promote the salt cod industry. So how can Norway gain more share of the salt cod industry from Iceland, for instance? Um, okay, next slide, please. Okay, that takes us to the conclusion. So I'll hand back to uh, Derek. Thank you, Ben. Okay, well, so this is, this presentation of conclusions then is going to be organized around some points on what we see as the strengths of the literature and then a number of areas of gaps and further work. And in terms of the presentation of these different points, I just want to acknowledge that it's very early days uh, for us. Um, so in other words, we haven't, we haven't systematically thought about either the strengths or the, the gaps. Um, and so what we're presenting now is some preliminary thoughts on that and we'll be interested to get some inputs from you uh, in the last few minutes of the of the time today on on these general points we're making. Uh, and then we'll work much, much more carefully on them as we begin to put all the pieces of the paper together uh, for this qualitative analysis. Okay, so in terms of strengths, one of the one of the major strengths of this literature that I want to really underscore here is that this, in comparison to the regular fisheries literature, I would say that this literature, is much stronger in terms of its orientation towards the global south. And there's a much greater presence of authors from the global south. And so that's, that's uh, you know, something we really need to recognize as a real strength of this literature. And in other words, it, it reflects better the, the relative global importance of, of fish and fish products um, for the global south, okay? It's also a literature that that in itself has a deep history. There's writing about dried fish that goes back into the colonial period. Uh, and, and so there has been a long-standing interest in dried fish. And so there's, there's a lot historically to draw on them in the literature for our purposes. And also there is a fairly strong thematic continuity within the literature. There, you know, throughout, throughout the literature, there has been a real interest in uh, processing techniques in particular um, and in, uh, in movements of dried fish um, through trade. as a couple of examples of, uh, of thematic continuity. The, the literature has a really strong focus on the nutritional benefits and health benefits, but also health threats uh, that exist within dried fish um, economies. And so that there, there's a lot of work that's been done on that, on that. There's been a fairly good conversation around these themes within the literature. And the literature has developed a, a number of innovative methods and technologies to address these key questions. And then within the literature, um, in addition to some of the, the richer and more diverse studies that Eric and Ben have covered in this presentation, within even the more narrow technical studies, there is what I 
label here as a considerable buried rich detail. So there are lots of sort of anecdotal asides, um, contextual asides, framings of many of the, the more narrowly focused papers in this literature that are actually quite worthwhile and, and worth bringing out um, as background to, to, to the dried fish literature. Okay, so that's the strengths. In terms of research gaps and opportunities, first of all, this, this qualitative review of the literature broadly reinforces what we hypothesize going into this project and what we know already. That, that is that the literature is fragmented and there's a real lack of synthetic analysis. And so this work that we're doing with the Global Literature Review then we think is very timely because it, it will begin to map out how we can uh, take this disparate body of work and begin to synthesize it into a more integrated format. Okay, and then the second point is that despite the rich works that Eric and Ben pointed to in their discussions, those works are very much in the small minority. They are, you know, they're, they're works that the high quality ones can be, can be limited to, to virtually a small handful. So they're, yeah, and so that obviously links then to an opportunity um, that, that clearly the DFM project can, can begin to fulfill, and that is to, to really enrich the literature with, with well-formulated, detailed social science and social ecological studies on dried fish. Next slide, please. So a major opportunity in the literature is that there is a need for much more of the systematic kinds of value chain studies that Ben pointed to in his presentation. There are literally just a couple of those that exist in the literature uh, of the high quality sort. Uh, and so DFM again stands poised to, to contribute in that area. Uh, there needs to be more critically based approaches to gender social difference uh, and other, you know, other key social economy kinds of variables in the study of value chains. There needs to be much more work done on the political ecology of dried fish. Again, there, there are literally one or two or three studies in this area. Um, and then the, the comparative environmental impact assessment of different dried fish value chains, uh, that's an area that, that, that really doesn't exist and uh, needs to be studied in, in more detail as well. Next slide, please. Then in the, the broad area of consumption, there are uh, there are some key gaps that are important in, in relationship to the, the broader ambition towards a more synthetic approach, more social economic approach to dried fish. The first one is that um, in, in terms of the way data is collected, often there it's very it's impossible to disaggregate data on dried fish consumption. And so from a policy point of view, that's something that the Dried Fish Matters project uh, needs to advocate for. But then where those data do exist, there are, there, there are no analyses or there are very few analyses of, um, of population level consumption patterns of dried fish. Uh, th those analyses, when they do exist, tend to be part of broader analyses of fish consumption in general. Um, so what DFM aims to do then is to, to you know, to lay the foundation for this kind of work, looking at variations in consumption of dried fish across different population groups uh, by gender, by class, by ethnicity, by religion, and so on, by region. Um, and then while there's an enormous amount of work done on the nutrient composition of dried fish, that literature hasn't been systematically analyzed, assessed to, to, to see where we have comprehensive knowledge of the nutrient composition of different species and different product types um, and where we are lacking that information. So that's, that's an area of key work in the more food science point of view, from the more food science point of view. And then as Eric mentioned, um, while there is some evidence of the application of a food security lens, it's, it's really very scanty in this area. And so looking at access, availability, utilization, uh, from a food security perspective uh, is a valuable, a valuable lens that can be applied. Next slide. Okay, and then from the, the policy governance development intervention point of view, 
Um, while there's a lot of attention to technical solutions to economic, you know, to, to increasing economic outcome out, or economic profitability or uh, health outcomes, those technical solutions typically lack a governance framework. So they're not they're not integrated uh, within the broader possibilities for governance that exist in particular dried fish economies. And so there needs to be a connection between these technical interventions and uh, how we will actually be able to implement them. Okay, and as Ben mentioned, there are a couple of papers that that you know that make a start in that direction, but DFM can do that much more comprehensively. There is there is some application of, let us say, rights-based approaches to uh, to labor in particular in dried fish economies, but um, they are they are also very scanty. So this is a this is an area that can be built upon substantially in the analysis of dried fish. Uh, and so Eric had mentioned uh, food sovereignty or cultural food security as possible ways of of theorizing rights-based approaches that would be applicable in the dried fish context. And then a final point here is that Eric had also mentioned the importance of understanding the socio-cultural factors that may shape these kinds of technical interventions that are proposed. And so that's, that's also a connection that typically has not been made in the literature on dried fish and an area that deserves, uh, deserves much greater attention. I believe that's it, Eric. Yes, okay. So perhaps we could return to the, the group screen and we and just take uh, 10 minutes or so for questions and discussion uh, hi Derek hi Rotimi yeah thanks very much you know really uh, very comprehensive and uh, very very interesting uh, presentation um, yeah, of course, I'm interested about the uh, what you mentioned last in terms of uh, the lack of really systematic review of you know nutritional value of dried fish. Um, in in that sense, you know, uh, how do you think it can be done? You know, uh, you previously mentioned uh, the possibility of having a PhD student in you know. Uh, that will work in that area in terms of nutrition or food science. Yeah, is that still something on the table, or, uh, or how do you think we can? Because I think it's really a very, very important uh, aspect of this project. You know, to look at, you know, really a comprehensive review, uh, not not only in terms of species, but even in terms of uh, production methods. You know, how yep. how do how do the production methods affect nutritional value, things like that. So uh, if we can get a very, you know, really a good student, you know, to to do a very, very good review, we can get it published in, a, in an excellent journal. So I'm just putting out there, you know, how do we go about that? That's, yeah, that's, that's obviously something we're very interested in, in DFM. I think that's a pressing need for the project. That's a pressing need in the literature. And, uh, I, I would support the idea of taking a PhD student on board to do that. We could alternately think of a postdoc uh, to take on a project like that. Um, as, you, as you imply, we need somebody who has the time available to comprehensively examine the literature. And that's, that's no small task. It's a time consuming task. We need somebody to be able to, de to be dedicated to that. So I would say that this could be a primary point for us to discuss next week when we have the uh, working the nutrition security working group meeting uh, and i think eric has just sent out just sent out yesterday a message with the the time for that meeting so let's uh let's discuss the the practicalities of how best to do that at that meeting okay i um is that is that is that a good idea rotimi yeah yeah definitely i think so uh, yeah i didn't yeah. get that that'll be that'll be coming just Eric, did, uh, I've got a question from Melissa. Did you want to say something to Rotimi? It looks like. I think her microphone is cut off. Okay. Hi, Melissa. Hi. Hi. Nice um, to have you with us. 
Yeah, nice to be able to attend. I firstly, congratulations. You really uh, covered a breadth and depth of the literature, and I was really impressed how you've already thought about it. And I think um, you're being, um, maybe the word would be too humble. I think you have a paper here if you wanted to. I mean, of course you can dig deeper and uh, do more theory building, but in terms of, of a state of, it struck me you've really got that nicely covered already, and that was really neat to see. Thank you. Um, I had two, two areas that were intriguing to me. Um, one was you talked about the health benefits, but also the threats seen of yep. dried fish. And yep. I had just been reading a, um, a story in the New York Times last night about nutritionists in the United States arguing that cultural food was often seen as unhealthy. And I wondered if some of the writing about dried fish had that colonial or uh, maybe it's too strong a word to say racist under overtone in it around nutrition. And if there's something interesting to think through about the time of when, if nutritional threats were being written about the context and why and how those studies emerged, I don't know, but that was just, it got me thinking a little bit about it. Um, unpacking sort of the benefits and the threats and yep. who was writing what. And then my other thought was, as you were talking about gaps, I, I guess for me, I often think about um, dried fish in terms of poverty or livelihood studies and the ability for people to enter uh, dry, the dried fish economy, um, kind of to move in and out of it. And how do we grapple with that in a time of overall uh, fish decline, right? So there's less access to um, at least the bigger fish to dry. So smaller and smaller fish in some cases might be being dried. So is there something there to that as well? Um, yeah, so those were just my two my two comments, uh, questions, queries. But in general, I really I really think you have a lot there that you could already shape. Thanks. Yeah, I I would invite uh, Eric and Ben to jump in, but let me take a stab at the first one, um, and then I'll I'll let uh, maybe Ben or yeah either of you guys think about the second one. But the the first one, this the 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 threats versus benefits in relationship to. Um, perceptions of dried fish and perceptions of the, the people who process dried fish, there is a, there's a kind of uneasy coexistence, I would say, in the literature of, of both perspectives. Uh, and I don't think the perspectives have really talked to each other necessarily, but th there is, there's some real celebrating of traditional dried fish products. And, and the Indian Northeast literature, I think, really stands out as one of the places where that's, that's quite prominent. You know, there's, it, within the Indian context, there's there's a real sense that this is this is a cultural hub for the production of traditional ecological knowledge, really, and and it's really viewed in that quite positive light. Um, but at the same time, there's also this this technical imperative, even in that literature as well, but but more broadly in the other literature. So we have this tech, this traditional ecological knowledge, but how do we improve it? Because uh, the, you know there are unhygienic practices in the way it's it's, uh, it's processed, um, or that there are possibilities within those products that uh, could be commercialized and scaled up. You know, so that, that to me speaks to the uneasy coexistence, the, sort of, you know, the, the, the presence of a kind of paternalizing gaze um, in, in this appreciation. Uh, in other areas of the literature, the judgment, the judgment is more explicit, and, uh, but then it's also complicated because the, the judgment is often not so much about traditional practices per se, but the the uptake of modern uh, applications. So it's it's uh, people, you know, it's processors in in sort of more traditional contexts, but using various chemical additives, which are very much the product of modern industrial economies. And uh, so we that that's something else that needs to be sorted out. So it's not it's not a clear cut colonial judgment. But rather, it's it, it really needs to be teased apart and, and analyzed carefully. Um, so, uh, Eric uh, and Ben, do you want to say anything else on that, or talk about Melissa's point about mobility in and out of dried fish and, and the trend from large to small fish? And I, I would say there, small fish have always been a really important part of dried fish production. Um, and and a key thing is that dried fish production is often um, from a cultural ecology point of view, a product of periods of bumper harvest. So when there, there are too many fish to be consumed fresh and then they get, they get processed uh, in place and often they're small fish being processed. And so, yeah, Ben, Eric. 
Either question? Yeah, sorry, my internet's been cutting out a little bit, uh, Derek. I, I missed uh, uh, most of Melissa's comment, but I think on the on the point of uh, you know sort of um, people shifting between different types of livelihood, for example, which may be relevant to what you just uh, you mentioned. I mean, I think there's a lot of um, uh, disciplinary kind of uh, siloing that's going on in the literature that we've looked at. Uh, people are uh, focusing on, say, fish producers as, or fishers as fishers, and, and processors as processors, for instance, without, you know, really taking this kind of holistic perspective. And we see that across the disciplines as well, you know, so we've got either a historical study or a technical study, you know, or a nutrition study, but very little that's kind of engaging uh, these differences uh, and, you know, th that's trying to cross those boundaries, either within the, the, the value chains or uh, crossing the the uh, the, the boundaries boundaries of, um, you know, uh, of different types of resources that people are drawing upon. And I did give that example of the, the, the one uh, sustainable livelihoods, uh, you know, study, which I think, you know, we probably need a lot more of uh, in order to understand how, you know, dried fish production or fish processing is not just something that exists on its own, uh, but that is much part, you know, part of a much broader uh, social economy. And likewise, you know, at the consumption level, you know, nobody's eating dried fish or, or fish paste or, you know, or condiments all on their own. They're part of a much, you know, broader diet. And so what is the interplay between, uh, you know, between those, those different commodities, different, uh, different foods, for instance. Uh, and I think this kind of transdisciplinarity and this more holistic approach is, is really something that emerges as uh, an area of, of importance within, uh, you know, within the literature for, for future study. Yeah, shall I come in? Um, so I, I think, yeah, great questions, uh, Melissa. Um, I, gu I guess like um, one of the things that makes dried fish so fascinating is that it's this sort of double-edged sword. So, um, you know, this, this kind of balance between its, in, its importance nutritionally, uh, but then the, the food safety aspects, right? Or, um, you know, its importance as a source of livelihoods versus the, the often very poor um, sort of labor arrangements, working conditions, right? Um, and so I think, yeah, there, there tends to be like, there, there's a lot of technical literature focusing on on food safety, um, but a lot of the, the interest in dried fish is coming from places where it's an important part of the diet. So there's many, many technical studies Looking at um, you know contaminants and um, carcinogens and so on that you know that, that are coming from the places where uh, the fish is being produced and consumed. Um, there's also lots of studies that um, sort of either emphasise the importance for for nutrition um, or the sort of the, the cultural importance as well. Um, and um, you know many many of those studies also coming from the same kind of places where where dry you know dry fish is being pr produced and consumed. So um, it's more of a, maybe more of a sort of a disciplinary lens rather than a, um, you know, uh, a sort of colonial lens, neo-colonial lens. Um, and it, yeah, in terms of sort of pressure on resources and um, the ability to move in and out of the fishery and the, the sort of, the, 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 um, I think there's there's sort of a handful of studies that um, sort of really look at those kind of questions in, in, in quite a lot of detail and, and, and sort of do it in a uh, sort of satisfying manner, but they really are only a handful. Um, and so definitely there's huge scope, um, hopefully through this project for, for more of those kind of studies, that, you know, really looking at the, the sort of livelihoods and the, the political kind of dimensions of um, of dry fish. Thank you. Maybe the tensions are what the paper could focus on. You've mm. eloquently kind of talked about both sides of of multiple ideas. Um, that could be really interesting to tease out in a paper. Like it's a going to be very hard to limit it to a paper. So I think well, this paper is going. Many. No, well, <laughs> we will we will produce. We're actually planning to produce two overview papers, and the one the one we're talking about today is the second of two. It's a, it's the uh, it's the qualitatively focused one, and then we'll have a quantitative one that that, that sets out the broad landscape. Um, but I think, you know, clearly from this discussion, uh, this is this is going to sit, to lay the groundwork for uh, follow up work, and so there there hopefully will be books at the end of this project as well, which will will add our original 
data contributions as well to the discussions. Okay, Madhu. Yes, hello, Derek. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for, for you and the team. I really uh, found the uh, presentation very helpful um, in terms of the gaps and the areas for research and uh, will be very helpful as we align um, our research proposals and, um, and uh, figure out the future work that we, um, the students, uh, will be doing. I have uh, two questions. Um, the first one is in relation to the sort of the boundaries of the um, the landscape of literature um, on dried fish and how to navigate that. And I ask this question um, mostly in relation to the gender um, studies that has been done in dried fish. And uh, when I try to write about the research gaps and um, and uh, try to find out the research questions. I often struggle um, in going back and forth because there has been not much gender, like a handful of gender studies um, that speaks to dried fish specifically. So I find myself going back and forth in between um, dried fish literature and small scale fisheries literature. Um, and I struggle to sort of make the case exclusively for, for looking at dried fish value chains, um, the gender aspects in dried fish value chains without um, necessarily going to uh, the small scale fisheries literature. Um, and I was wondering if you have any thoughts around that as to how we sort of make the case uh, by only looking at dried fish literature. Um, and my second question is on the institutional context. Uh, based on what we know about dried fish and how it's um, like socially organized um, um, in the, the countries we are looking at, are there any insights that's emerging in relation to uh, the institutions that are um, sort of involved in, these, um, in this sector, other than the sort of the policy side that may have uh, implications to dried fish, any specific uh, institutions like producer organizations and things like that. I'm going to invite probably Eric to respond on the gender points and uh, Ben or Eric to talk about the institutional dimensions. Um, but I wanna just respond quickly on your first question about the, the, the boundary between dried fish and small scale fisheries literatures. and. Uh, there, I think I just make the simple point that for the purposes of this work, this literature review work within the project, we are limiting, we're, we're keeping those boundaries fairly, fairly tight because we want, to, we want to get an understanding and present a baseline for the shape of that literature to, to the broader public. Okay? And um, so we're not, we, we may be sort of implicitly drawing on some ideas about what small scale fisheries are in terms of interpreting that literature, particularly from a social mm -hmm. economy point of view, but we're not, um, we're not attempting to bring the small scale fisheries literature in, in, uh, you know, in, in a comparative way, systematically, let's say. But mm -hmm. for student projects and for projects run by the different research teams, uh, I think we need to keep that boundary extremely porous because in terms of developing an understanding of the social economy perspective on dried fish, we have to be making connections to, to insights from other literatures and, and the small scale fisheries literature being a crucial one for understanding livelihoods, dynamics, historical changes, um, patterns of um, resource management and so on. So yes, in, uh, so absolutely uh, in, your, in your literature review for, your, for the development of your, your PhD thesis, um, you're, it would be incomplete without without engaging seriously with the gender literature, the small scale fisheries literature, the resilience literature, what, what have you. Is that, does that answer that part of your question? Yes, it does, yes. Okay. So then in terms of the substance and this issue of boundaries, um, I invite my other two presenters to respond to that, uh, maybe particularly Eric, and then on the, the institutional context question, uh, yeah, again, the, the, the other two of you, if you'd like to reflect on that. Sure, I could jump in on the, on the question of gender because I was looking at that. And I think your assessment of the literature is, is accurate. Uh, there's very, very little that explicitly uh, describes gender. 
Um, and I think we did come across a number of resources that claim to take a gender lens or that, that you know, announce themselves as feminist but are not really, um, and that are more kind of descriptive of um, you know, uh, gender divisions of labor without actually engaging uh, the ideologies or the social roles or the, the, the broader implications of, of gender difference. And I you know, was trying to, to highlight, for instance, the, the, the absence of uh, you know, the, 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 the ideas of gender ideology or intersectionality, for instance, in, in much of the literature. Um, you know, we see uh, the role of women uh, in, in fisheries uh, and in production addressed in some of the development sector reports, particularly coming out of Africa, uh, where there is a goal of, um, you know, integrating women into uh, production streams as well by getting women as, uh, to become fishers, uh, but not really addressing sort of why it is that, uh, uh, you know, women uh, have traditionally and continue to be uh, engaged more strongly in, uh, in processing. I mean, we may see, may see a passing acknowledgement of the fact that, you know, women also have childcare duties, but not really a, a strong engagement uh, of these sort of competing demands uh, on women in, 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 the, uh, in the fish value chains uh, and fish processing sector. And, you know, so the, the, the fact that you may be a, a fish processor and a mother and, you know, potentially a Muslim woman to give the, the example uh, from earlier, um, you know, or, you know, there are various other roles the, the kind of uh, uh, place competing demands uh, on people, not, not just women, but, uh, but men as well, that I think uh, could very fruitfully be uh, uh, examined here, but that are not uh, currently, and certainly not with, uh, uh, in relation to the, uh, the dried fish um, sector. So what we do see a lot more of is, is more of these socioeconomic um, kind of um, you know, survey type uh, uh, representations of, you know, how much income women are earning, uh, how much time they're spending on, on fish processing and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And do you have any thoughts on the second question, the institutional question? Yeah, I'm sorry, I didn't quite uh, catch the institutional question. Um, so it's uh, it's it's about it's about the kind of institutions that are linked to dry fish value chains. What does the literature say in regards to that? Like in addition to policies like fisheries policies and nutritional policies that may have implications of how the value chains are run. Um, are there any specific institutions that look after dry fish sets, like producer cooperatives and anything, things mm. like that? Were there any any evidence to that in the in the body of literature? Uh, yeah, no, that, that's a really good point. I think um, where there's discussion of institutions, it tends to be. Um, mm or informal institutions anyway, it tends to be sort of in relation to um, the sort of governance of fisheries themselves rather than, um, yeah, through, uh, for instance, market associations, for instance, tra trader associations, those, those kind of institutions. Um, but they're actually very prevalent, I, I would think, probably in most places that, that dried mm -hmm. fish is being being traded um, mm -hmm. and also produced, you know, um, just thinking of some of the examples from Bangladesh, um, the, like the, the boat captains have an, an association, the, the boat workers have an association, the, the um, fish processors have their own association, there's like two different market associations. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. um, that's probably actually quite a rich um, uh, area that can be um, explored in a lot more detail. Um, but yeah, I don't think there's, there's very much in the literature at all that springs mm -hmm. to mind anyway. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this is exactly part of the sort of the struggle that I have. Like we know there's a huge gap, but then when I write, I struggle to make the case based on the sort of the literature that's available because there's think... none. But yeah. There, there uh, Madhu, I think you can, you can very, um, with great, you know, great validity, you can make the hypothesis that based on the, uh, on the broader small scale fisheries literature that we know that there mm -hmm. is the existence of these institutions, economic and political, cultural, in terms mm -hmm. of their orientation. And so um, th th there's a very compelling hypothesis that similar institutions must exist with regard to dried fish as well. And you can indirectly see them through some of the references. So the, mm -hmm. the work by Raniel, who's on the, 
on the um, and joined this meeting. And Holly, uh, they, you know, both of them from an ethnographic point of view have highlighted the kinds of organizations that exist on the ground um, to facilitate trade. Uh, and so, again, you know, we this is an area where we have to uh, we have to eliminate the boundary between dried fish and other areas of work in fisheries uh, to take inspiration. Okay, um, we are we are over time, but I I'm uh, I'm so I'd encourage anybody who needs to leave to that you of course leave at any time, but I'd like to keep the discussion going a little bit longer because a number of questions have come up. Um, so in order, I have a question from Genia, then I have uh, questions from Gayatri, and then I've seen a couple more just pop up, uh, Dilanti, Kyoko, Priya. Um, so let's start with Genia. Yes, uh, first of all, like, congratulations. This was a brilliant uh, coverage and a comprehensive you know, coverage of uh, the literature and very, very enlightening. And uh, I mean, this seems to be very lucrative to uh, researchers. But again, I mean, uh, the point of caution is that, you know, we might feel too ambitious to, you know, kind of deploy a couple of uh, these frameworks and uh, things like that. So, uh, I mean, with this, I would just uh, raise this technical uh, question that, like, um, I, I'm sorry that I missed the quantitative, I mean, the lecture on quantitative, um, uh, on quantitative literature review, uh, but uh, I was just thinking that, you know, um, um, uh, because I see like, for example, in Ben's uh, presentation that he talks about political ecology, he talks about cultural ecology and also policy governance and how you know these also get imposed on the value chain analysis to make it stack value chain, if I understand it correctly. So uh, now the question is like, I mean, uh, is there any opportunity in this project through which uh, some training uh, can be provided uh, to young researchers and also to, you know, mainly also the PhD students through which uh, we can uh, kind of know more about how uh, we can uh, kind of apply socio-ecological systems research and uh, so many other social sciences frameworks for our own empirical uh, uh, case studies uh, or case sites so that we can understand you know, where uh, our expertise and our strength actually lies and how can we uh, you know, do justice uh, uh, to this. And also the final point is that, you know, um, uh, so I think like, there was a discussion that uh, how Zotero uh, can be used. And I also think that, you know, is there any possibility through which uh, literature can be classified? I mean, the way you have done it so brilliantly. So if uh, we can access it uh, very easily and uh, conveniently through Zotero or something else, so that uh, we can immediately, you know, have all this uh, 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 with, with a single click. So yes, so how to optimize on the opportunity of uh, also integration of frameworks and finally like uh, I am sure that you know when uh, we'll have uh, these working group meetings, finally different working groups will talk to each other and there will be a lot of cross, I mean exchange and cross fertilization of frameworks. So uh, I'm just thinking that how we can also think about more and more um, integrated perspective or integration of frameworks through which uh, we would be able to you know uh, capture uh, complexities in uh, uh, dry fish uh, sector. Thank you very much, Genia. Um, yeah, for those very helpful questions. The, um, I'll let Eric answer the Zotero one. Uh, on the, the, the first point though, the one you, the, the question uh, you made has a couple of aspects to it. Um, it's, it's about training and it's about how to deploy more integrative frameworks. And so very broadly, that is the big challenge we face in this project, is, is how to take an area of, of study, an important economic area in, in, in you know, the, the dry fish sector, and how to move our understanding of that sector from the current very fragmented state to over the course of a seven year project to a more integrative state. Um, and that's up to us. And so the, the process, it, it's very, that's very much a process question. It's how in the context of this project can we develop internal processes linking with external players that, um, that most efficiently allow us to integrate our understanding and to, to begin to apply uh, theoretical perspectives, methodological approaches that so far haven't been used in the area. And so I think you're very right to say, okay, the working groups are going to be a key building 
platform for that. And it's so I'm excited to see the outcomes of those working group discussions because I think in particularly, for example, in the context of the social economy working group, we will start to see maybe subgroups emerge around different um, theoretical methodological thematic areas like social ecological systems um, or uh, social well-being, for example. And hopefully collectively we'll begin to to refine our understanding of the dried fish sector through those lenses. And then at the end of the project, I hope we'll be looking at outputs that will really, really synthesize um, you know, our, our deliberations in those areas. Um, and I also see the, I see the student working group is really important. I think the student working group um, can drive attention to very important areas of focus. And so I would invite the students to, to reach out to us at DFM Central or to different actors in the DFM project and say, look, we really need a training in stacked value chain methods. So put together something for us. And as the project goes on, those trainings will get better, hopefully, as we begin to integrate them more closely with the material and the, the findings of the project. Okay. But it's, it's an evolving process. That's my answer to you. And, and I please, please keep pushing us on that and please participate to the fullest in terms of helping us realize the success of that process. Uh, Eric on Zotero. Oh, sure. Okay. Well, uh, we didn't really address the the methods behind all of this. Uh, I think you know, Derek uh, presented more on that in the in the previous uh, webinar, and I can I can take this up uh, in more depth, perhaps um, uh, you know later on, and, and uh, share more uh, written resources on 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 the Zotero library. Uh, so basically, all that we've been looking at and describing in today's presentation is you know uh, it's all present there within this this shared uh, online database, uh, and you can access all of the themes that we were describing there with the the, the hashtags um, and you know filter the resources by those uh, by those tags uh, within that online database so I can you know we have a number of instruction documents which I'll I'll send out again um, I know that some of you uh, in the group here have, have looked at that and and others uh, have not yet had the chance to do so but uh, so that resource is there and it's intended to be kind of a living library right so um, you know it's not a, a complete uh, study that sort of is, is frozen uh, in the sense that you know everyone is welcome to and encouraged to add resources to this library library and sort of build our understanding uh, of this uh, of this global dried fish literature uh, as you know as the, the project uh, progresses and and well beyond so um, so I, that's what I'd have to say about uh, Zotero for now I think maybe we can follow up on that and, and certainly through the thematic working groups uh, that's something that uh, they could, we could um, take up as well I think just one ad addition there Eric you, you may have mentioned this I was just going through the chat to see who wanted who should come up next but Jeannie I mentioned this idea of a button that could then bring up a certain area of work. Right. Um, and so in, in consistent with what Eric just said about the living quality of this database, there are indeed actually now already buttons. So the buttons are the tags. So those tags will allow you to identify certain bodies of literature. Um, so you could press on, you could, you could click on um, nutrition, food and nutrition security, for example, and get all the, the literature that we've tagged with that, uh, with that particular theme. Um, but because the, the, the database is, is a living one, as Eric suggests, you can, make, you can make combinations of those tags. You can produce new tags that, that identify subsets of the literature. And then that becomes a button for everybody else in a very helpful way. And there are also folders which collate searches, which you can see as a kind of button as well. You can click on that folder and you can get combinations of different tags. Yeah, I could also add, maybe this is anticipating uh, Gayatri's comment here in, in the chat. Uh, I think she was asking about migration, and that was one of the themes that we did not include uh, in our, our tag. So we did kind of start out with a set of themes relevant to the DFM project and kind of were looking for very specific things. Uh, some of them, you know, we found a lot of evidence of them, particularly in the in the technical field. Others, none at all. Like we had the commensality, which I mentioned a couple of times. I, I didn't see anything uh, really on, on that, uh, or certainly not in, in a, a direct sense. Um, but there are also other themes and tags that you know are not part of the data set simply because we weren't looking for them. And so um, I think migration might be one of those. And maybe uh, Derek or Ben could comment if you if you saw anything specifically on migration. Yeah. So Gayatri has two questions. Uh, Gayatri, unless you want to add to them, I'll just point everybody to the chat. One: Were there any studies that focused on migration of people? 
linking to fish processing practices and consumption practices? And then two, any ideas on the gender of authors who are writing on studying dried or writing on or studying dried fish in the global south and elsewhere? And that's that's really that the second question is a really interesting one, and that's worth thinking about. So we we did have the idea of doing an analysis of the literature by institutional uh, affiliation of the authors, but this is this is another really good idea for for analyzing sort of from a metadata point of view um, an aspect of the literature we hadn't thought about. And so I would, in answer to question two, uh, I don't know, but my hunch would be that it's primarily men. Uh, but yeah, um, Ben, Eric, I, I don't know if you have any additional thoughts on that. The technical literature is dominated by men for sure. And Gayatri here is shaking her head. <laughs> with with dissatisfaction at the answer or dissatisfaction at Very the Very much so. No, no, I, that trend, because I also suspect that's, yeah. that's probably the, yeah. uh, but it, I think it'd be really interesting to, you know, take a look at that. We uh, have just, we have just hired two undergraduate students to help us uh, clean the, the, the database up a bit. Um, we could ask them to address this question. The only problem there is they, it's not always obvious if the, the, the author is a male or a female from the name. And particularly somebody from a, a Euro-Canadian background um, won't necessarily be able to perceive that. So if we were, if we were to pursue this as, a, as an area of research, we would we'd have to have those students reach out to, to our colleagues in other countries and help with uh, the identification. And sometimes names are ambiguous. You can't tell from the name whether it's male or female. Uh, on point one, studies that focused on migration of people linking to fish processing practices and consumption practices. Uh, I, yeah, I, I can't think of anything off the top of my head. There's, I think there's a handful and maybe they don't take migration as the main sort of object of the study, but it, it features in them. So there's one I can think of from um, Indonesia um, that talks about migration quite a lot. There's another one that it was kind of like, a, it was, I, I don't even know how you describe it. It was sort of about, about the semiotics of, of dried fish from South Asia in Canada. Um, do you know the paper I'm talking about, Derek? Yeah. <laughs> I, don't, I don't really know how you explain it, but that, so that was that, you know, there was a link there between migration and, and, and consumption and sort of um, meaning, I guess. Um, uh, yeah, the, 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 there's little bits and pieces. I'm sure there's um, a couple of studies from Africa as well when migration plays a role. Um, but uh, definitely um, an under researched area and um, somewhere where there's lots and lots of potential and could also be sort of a, a sub theme within the, within DFM. It also depends a little bit on how we define migration. If we, if we take a broad definition of migration and extend it more out to being movement, then I think that the literature is a bit larger. So you, in that sense, you could think about the literature about uh, the movement of, of fish and the fish trade around the North Atlantic as being a kind of migration. It's, you know, it's, it's like a, it's a seasonal migration of fishers and processors uh, historically to process fish, um, but it's not, it's not a permanent migration. There are also a few examples that I recall seeing about uh, the, the um, transfer of technologies like fishing technologies uh, by Chinese migrants. Uh, throughout uh, Southeast Asia. Um, and I could pull out those references if you're interested. I mean, that's more historical kind of migration, but, you know, still very relevant in, insofar as, uh, you know, a lot of the, the kind of traditional or what might be perceived as traditional fishing practices and, and uh, processing practices now, um, you know, came about because of, uh, because of these, these uh, uh, migrations in, in recent history. Yeah, I mean, you just could... to add... Sorry, I mean, Go just ahead. to add why, why I brought the question up was, and I use the term migration quite consciously, because for me, it was 
really you know permanent movement of people Mm -hmm. uh, and I did think of the diaspora links, the so-called diaspora links as well, because in the Cambodian context, the traders were, I mean, they, when we ask about exports, sometimes they actually refer to people buying uh, dried fish or fermented fish from them and, you know, sending it to their relatives in Canada or Germany or something like that as export. Um, so it's, um, and it seems, and then there's also that, you know, consumption patterns are changing because people are moving from the rural areas to the urban areas and the urban areas, people don't eat these uh, mm -hmm. processed fish products. And again, there, there's no, there aren't people uh, to process fish because they have all, you know, migrated to Thailand in, in, in the Cambodian context. So it's coming up in a different, uh, a different uh, points. Uh, of the of the scoping study uh, mm. in Cambodia, so I, 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 to me, it seems quite central, uh, but I also didn't come across a lot of literature, so which is why I asked um, that question. You're right to you're right to indicate that this is an area uh, where DFM can make a major contribution to the literature, particularly in the contemporary context, and I think at best from the literature we can infer large-scale permanent migration movements um, by, you know, patterns of, say, consumption of certain kinds of products, but there's very little actually documenting the actual migration patterns. Uh, Let's, uh, actually, but, um, I'm going to yes. put you at the end of the line unless you have a point specifically on this one yeah, about just, migration. Yes, yes. Okay. So when we're reading, uh, reading articles uh, theme-wise, so I, mm -hmm. I found two articles uh, which have uh, specifically described about feminization and migration uh, through uh, DFM sectors. Okay, so feminization of, of okay, so see, is it the out-migration of men and leading to the feminization of labor in dried fish processing? Yes, m women's, women's yep. Uh, yep. out-migration, yes. Oh, women's Maybe from, out Yes, women for yeah. uh, fish, dry fish processing purposes. So yeah. maybe it's from Vietnam to, to Thailand or Thailand to Vietnam, I forgot, but I can uh, search for it. Maybe you could share those references with Gayatri? Yes, Because that's I will. directly in her area, her geographical area of focus. You may already be aware of them, but that would be great. Yeah. Please. Yeah, I will. Yeah. If you don't have her email, just, just let me know. Yeah. Okay, um, so Dilanthi, you have a question about dynamics of in dry fish processing. You want to tell us your question, or shall I just read it? Uh, hello, Derek. Uh, yes, uh, uh, I want to know because uh, through our uh, scoping studies, we are getting uh, information related to that uh, the dried fish processing method the, are changing. Uh, there is a progression to meet the scale of operation. Mm. With, the, with the increasing demand as well as uh, because of the consumption pattern due to this uh, lifestyle changes, all these things. So we are getting information uh, about these things. So my question is, uh, is there, this is not uh, exactly the evolution, but uh, really regarding the, 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 the changes in the processing methods, uh, such kind of things related to dynamism. Is, is there any studies uh, had been done in uh, other countries Mm. Eric, do you recall anything that specific looking at uh, the evolution of the processing industry in relationship to, say, economic change, consumer preferences? Uh, maybe I would defer to Ben on this and the and the value chains. I mean, there's there's all the, the all the uh, European literature is very much kind of in in that vein, is not is it not? Especially um, yeah. the scale of operation because uh, the uh, because people are moving from small scale to large scale or medium scale and uh, to because of that uh, be, uh, the, the, the scale of operation they have changed their uh, me, uh, method uh, it means not expanding the business but also the processing methods uh, from past to present so we have uh, identified such kind of uh, dynamism in the uh, in the processing uh, sector, dried fish processing sector. I, I feel like the, the kinds of studies that sort of look, look at those kinds of dynamics tend to be sort of historical studies. 
Um, so like the, 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 the book, The Closing of the Frontier, which is sort of like a history of fisheries development in Southeast Asia, um, I'm sure probably has things to say about, um, you know, the changing scale of operations and so on. But um, yeah, nothing springs to mind that's more, more recent. It, you know, one, one thing that comes to my mind is just that the point you're making, Delanti, suggests that there is potentially some take up of the kinds of technical innovations that uh, are prevalent in the literature and to some extent driven by research in government organizations uh, within the industry itself. And if, if that is the case in Sri Lanka, I think that would be a very interesting point to bring out because my impression is that often this technical literature, these, these sort of processing um, research efforts are kind of disconnected from the ground reality. But, but if you can identify in Sri Lanka, then in fact, there is an integration that would be very valuable to point out. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, so yeah, yeah. Please keep that in mind. Uh, I haven't finished going through your literature review for the Sri Lanka case, so maybe that that is there already, uh, and and I think it's it's very much deserving of emphasis. Okay. Um, so Mustafa has to leave. So he, maybe uh, Mustafa, before we give the floor over to. Uh, Priya, I guess, then, or Kyoko and then Priya. Did you want to make a quick point before you head off, Mustafa? Uh, thank you very much, Derek. Uh, what I was talking about that when Ben and myself were working in Bangladesh, we found that from north, northern uh, Silet area of Bangladesh, the seasonal migration of labor has been going on for, I think, for decades. So people from Bangladesh who are expert in fermenting fish, they, they go to India and then they help them. So that's all to know, but I don't know about any publication. Also, my second point is about using the preservatives during processing and during trading. And it has been going on in Bangladesh, but I would like to know if there are some publications or literature from other countries like India, Myanmar, um, Sri Lanka, even Cambodia, Vietnam. That's so. Then we can we can compare or something like that. That's, thank you very much. On the second point, I, I can't tell you off the top of my head, but uh, that would be something that we could very easily generate for you. Uh, so if you if you send me an email with that question, um, I can get you an answer. But my my uh, my sense is that yes. This interest in uh, contaminants spans multiple countries. It's not just limited to Bangladesh. It's uh, I think it's there in the African literature as well. Yes, it's de no now I yeah it's definitely there in the African literature. There there's quite a lot of work um, doing component analysis, particularly trying to identify uh, chemical contaminants. Uh, okay, thank you on, very much. On the first question, yes, in the, in, I, I was I mean the, in the Indian literature there is. Um, there is some mention of the presence of the influence and maybe the migration also out of Bangladesh into India for trade purposes that have that have had an influence um, around fermented fish in particular. But it's it's very much a minor theme in the literature, uh, and it's something that needs to be built upon. So Kyoko, you had a question. If I can just read out. Okay. Did you find research that analyzed the impact of food safety control on small fish processors? And so this is the connection, if I understand correctly, between policy implementation and, um, and let's say economic or livelihood kinds of aspects um, on small, small fish processors. I am not aware of literature that, that covers this, but I could have missed something. Uh, Eric, Ben, I did either of you See any some see anything about the sort of unintended consequences of, of policy impacts around food safety? 
Yeah, not so much unintended uh, consequences, but I would certainly identify this as an, as one of the gaps, right? We do see a number of articles, including sort of building on uh, uh, Mustafa's point about uh, you know preservatives and, and you know chemical contamination. I mean, we see a number of uh, articles that make the argument that we need more stringent standards or that we need better uh, implementation of the the standards that already exist, right, in order to to have uh, a safe a safe food supply. Uh, but there's not really all that much uh, in the way of engagement with the, the social context or the reasons why people are continuing to, uh, to use harmful chemicals, for instance, or, or to, to flout the rules to, you know, not to follow the standards. Um, and sort of my suspicion is that, you know, there's more to the story than, than just, uh, you know, the fact that people aren't aware of the standards or that they are not aware of the health risks. Uh, there may be, you know, there's probably a much more, but we don't really know because uh, there, there's almost nothing at all published on that. Um, and there's one example that I, I, I didn't present, but, you know, there's, uh, you know, mercury from artisanal mines uh, in Ghana that, you know, con contaminated fish, uh, fish, uh, um, you know, in uh, the, that went into the into the fish supply, the dried fish supply, um, and we can see here that you know efforts to uh, promote uh, art artisanal mining is you know people are turning a blind eye to the to uh, to the environmental contamination there. Uh, there have been a number of uh, projects there to to support artisanal mining, uh, but at the same time, this has had uh, impacts outside of the the sector there. So, um, I, I mean, again, I, I think we need to look in some cases beyond uh, beyond the, the the fish sector itself. Um, in terms of the, the, the policy and, and, and standards. Um, I know definitely there's some work on standards uh, in, in the literature on salted cod. Mm. Um, I think that's actually quite a, an important theme in that, that literature. Um, and I, I feel like there's maybe um, articles that mention the, the effects of... Um, Sort of where where dried fish products are being exported, um, maybe how sort of the, the standards in importing countries um, have an effect. Although I can't think of a specific example, um, but also I think a lot of the production is sort of taking place under conditions that are not sort of regulated at all. Then um, if there are domestic standards, they're certainly not being enforced. Um, but I, I don't know, there, there must be a middle ground also, um, uh, sort of places where there are kind of emerging standards that are having some kind of an effect. Uh, but yeah, I, I, yeah, an, an, another, another gap to be explored. Okay, uh, we, are, we are well over time. And uh, I think we're down to our last question from Tria. And it's a question that I think echoes the question that Madhu made earlier about, um, the presence of institutional or organizations or informal institutions that within the, the dried fish sector to regulate various aspects of relationships. Um, and here, I, I think I would just reiterate what I said earlier that, in fact, as far as we have been able to find, there's very, very little attention to this in the literature. And this does represent a major area uh, for, for research for the project. Uh, and again, I would say, there's a lot of work that's been done on this in small scale fisheries that we can learn from and uh, we can we can build hypotheses from to apply uh, to just to, to the dry fish sector. Uh, and we do know from our preliminary uh, scoping research that there is quite a bit of evidence has been also men previously mentioned in places like Bangladesh about the existence of associations to to regulate to some degree economic relationships. Is that, Priya, does that uh, answer the question? Uh, yeah, in fact, I was just asking what the yeah, informal sectors, like informal institutions within the communities, for example, like uh, caste based pension, certain. Actually, you had that theme where you were talking about cultural and social relations. So I was yeah. kind of looking at that, and it is amazing the review of literature that you have presented. It was like overwhelming. <laughs> so I was looking for, forward uh, further into it, and then I was like, okay, fine. This is also something interesting. <laughs> I think yeah. it created further questions. <laughs> yes, so, good. Yeah, that's, that's, that's precisely what uh, literature should, review should do. And I'm glad that we stimulated you to, to think in that direction. And uh, yeah, it's very consistent with the mandate of the project 
to be examining informal institutions, caste panchayats, what have you. Um, okay. So, you, and Kevin. Kyoko has made a last point um, about aquaculture and saying that, uh, yes, uh, standards ha did end up excluding a lot of small scale pr producers. Um, and so that to me, certainly learning from that experience and other experiences around regulation um, and standards implementation is something that we can look to and uh, apply in the, the sort of the policy governance realm in the project. Um, okay, um, I, sh we, I think we should sign off there. Uh, the numbers have dwindled, but uh, this is a really productive and helpful discussion. Uh, thank you everybody for participating so well. And, uh, and just a reminder that next week, Eric has announced uh, three different working group meetings and I would encourage you to, to kindly join those meetings and we can continue some of these discussion threads in those meetings. So, and thank you, Ben, for staying up so very late and for Kyoko I also I know who's staying up very late and many other of you, uh, Nova, for example, from the Philippines who are up past midnight, I suspect. Um, yeah, have a, good, have a good night, those the rest of you and a uh, good day for those of you still in Canada. Okay, bye-bye and thanks for joining. Bye.